Now every one of us knows that there's something wrong inside. We have a tendency within us that disturbs us. We long for victory over sin, sins of thought and word and deed. And the Bible reveals that we are born radically wrong. We are members of a human race that has turned its back upon God. There's something inside that makes it easier to go wrong than to go right. And some deep evil seems to sap the human race. There's a bias in the bowl that takes it off course. There's a gravity that pulls us down when we want to rise high in spiritual attainment. And the secret is that something within us has died. The spiritual part of our being that God gave us has died because of sin. This is the reason why we can neither see nor enter the kingdom of heaven unless there is a radical change. And here is a great revelation from Holy Scripture, and we also know it in our own experience, that we cannot make this radical change ourselves, that God says you must have, you must know, you must experience, if you are ever to see or enter the kingdom of heaven. Why the cross? Because on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ was made sin for you. He bore your sin, sir, in his body on the tree. He was the only man who ever went through hell on earth. And he did it for you, to cleanse you from the stain of sin, to deliver you from the power of sin, to clear you from the penalty of sin, so that there could be nothing between you and God. Christ Jesus bore your sin in his body on the tree. So ladies and gentlemen, we come to this great conclusion tonight, that unless God is willing to do something about it, we are sunk. And there is no hope of us ever entering or seeing the kingdom of heaven. But here is the Christian gospel, ladies and gentlemen. Here is the good news that God loves us. Because he loves us, he's willing, he's yearning to undertake this great change for us. Only we are willing. And because Christ has died and risen again, I have wonderful news for you here tonight. Hundreds of you here yearn to know what it is to be in the kingdom of God. Hundreds of you want to know the victory that God gives to those that belong to Christ. If you will repent, believe and confess, God will do the rest. He will come into your cleansed being that he now possesses. And he will live his life in you. He will give you eternal life, divine life. Right now you will enter the kingdom of heaven. And you will live in the kingdom of heaven whilst you're on earth. And when death comes, it won't be death. You'll be with Christ and you'll go into the glory of eternal heaven. That is what God will do for you tonight if you will repent and believe and confess it. After a video like that, we probably don't need a sermon, do we? I love that video. It speaks so much of so many different angles and variations. Well, if you're joining us today, we are still in the midst of our harvest series. And yes, I got all gussied up for you guys. I found my bib overalls and my best tablecloth and put them on for you guys today. Amen? Are you guys awake? It just seems a little melodious in here today. I know we're a few. Hey, could you guys move up just a little bit? You don't have to be so far away. My goodness. Come on up. Listen, I want to tell you about me. I grew up on a farm in Illinois. I am one of 10 kids, uh, two girls, eight boys. The girls are the bookcases, eight boys. Uh, my dad was a farm hand, not the farm er. So my dad was kind of like an indentured servant or sharecropper, whatever you want to call him. And so on the farm, my dad made $100 a week raising 10 kids. I know what it's like to grow up very poor, very hungry. Um, all these other things we think that only happen in the inner city. Believe it or not, they very much happen in rural places as well. And on the farm, we all had chores. We all had jobs. We had a garden. The garden was probably one acre big. And we would have to grow our own vegetables. And we would grow them. And everybody had an area. And my area was usually around the pumpkins and the watermelons. When it came to livestock, uh, the farmer usually had at our little farm uh, some cows, just a few, some pigs. And I belonged to what was called FFH. Anybody know what FFH is? 
Future Farmers of America, FFA, excuse me, not FFH. That's an actual Christian band, sorry. Um, FFA, Future Farmers of America. And my project was chickens. Now, I didn't raise just regular chickens. My grandfather would even, the old mail order catalogs, he would get me these really cool chickens with flumes and all that. And one time I, I took a beating from my mom, which is also called a spanking, for trying to give my favorite chicken a bath in the bathtub and all this. I mean, I straight up was raised on the farm, right? I tell everybody I'm not from the projects. I'm straight off the farm. And we had this old farm all tractor. And it was the type of tractor my dad would use when I was a kid. And it was just these old, they call them antique tractors. And there was no cab. There was no air conditioning. We used it on the farm to move wagons or to run augers and probably things you don't understand about. But it was the type of tractor my dad used whenever he was younger. Believe it or not, my dad was browner than the pews you were sitting in when he passed away. And that was when he was light-skinned. He had spent, he, my dad had to quit school in the third grade. When my dad died, he could barely read or write his own name. But he had spent his entire childhood and life working on, as a farm hand. And on that old farm all tractor, there was not like these new tractors. There was no air conditioning. There was no cabs for shade. He would just sit out in the sun and bake himself. His pigment changed. Matter of fact, to this day, I don't sunburn. And I can get extremely dark if I hang outside. And my kids are the same way. Some people think that's cool. Um, I think it's cool. But with this job, I don't have the time to go hang out on the beach all day. But it's interesting, the next generation, my brother Scott, he still works as a farmhand for another farmer. Except for his tractor is a little different. I don't know if you guys see on Facebook when I went home this past year for a little family reunion. My brother Scott got the, one of the uh, older tractors, which is only like two years old and parked in his front yard because that's what farmers do. And it was um, this tractor that had um, six sets of dual wheels all the way around. It's this giant behemoth green John Deere tractor. And in this tractor, there's a laptop. There's even a filing cabinet. There's a GPS system in this tractor. And while my dad would take a tractor and reach around the back and be dropping seeds, my brother Scott just puts in a coordinates and the tractor does all the work. This tractor will literally drop a seed within a millimeter of where it's supposed to be to make sure there's the exact growth space between it and another corn stalk or soybean plant. It gives the exact width and, and it goes off GPS to give the, the maximum amount of rows and all that to make sure that that acreage is perfect. That's an amazing thing when you see it. And I decided when I was younger, I did not want to be a farmer. I didn't want to work that hard. So I chose to be a pastor where I'm called 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. It wasn't a great plan, but I love my job. But it's interesting when you look at how farming has progressed. And by the way, farming is a very honorable career. Matter of fact, we all eat because there's farmers, right? Listen, if you get a chance to think of farmer, think of farmer. And I, I know a lot is being built in greenhouses. You know, we talk about organic. I'll take stuff grown in the dirt than stuff in a factory. Amen. But if we go back to really the old time, since we're a church and we're talking about Jesus, farming was a little different. And you have to understand the context of which farming was done. And so if we look at our sanctuary here, there would a little be plots of land like this row of pews right here would be a plot of land and there would be one and there would be one in there. And it would just go on forever. And so people would walk these paths in between. And that's your plot of farming. And a farmer would have this big satchel uh, bag. They didn't have burlap back then. So it was probably some kind of hide of some sort. And there would be seeds. And they would reach in and they would just start throwing seeds. Have you ever sown grass? You just kind of throw it everywhere. And that's the way it was done. And so Jesus uses this knowledge of farming to tell a parable found in Mark 4. They teach people about themselves. So many times we, we misconstrued what Jesus is talking about. But this morning I would like for you to join me in Mark 4 as we read the first 20 verses. It's called the, the parable of the sower. Now the difference is, you may wonder if you're the sower. If you're the seed or if you're the soil. Join me in this reading and let's see at the end of this what you think you are. Mark 4, New American Standard, excuse me, NIV, 
1 through 20. And again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The large crowd gathered around him was so large that he got into the boat and sat on it out on the lake. While the people were along the shore in the water's edge, he taught many things and parables. And in his teachings, he said, listen, I love this. I don't know if you guys ever pay attention to the punctuation. It also gives you an idea, the tonality and all that. So I want you to always pay attention to the punctuation. We're about to jump into an area where Jesus says, only those who are enlightened will understand. But I think it's funny, as we get ready to read this, you'll find out even the disciples didn't understand. So it makes sense that sometimes we don't understand, which also shows why we need to listen. So he says, listen. Let me find it. A farmer went out to sow his seeds. And as he scattered the seeds, some fell on the path and the birds came up and ate it. Some fell on rocky places where it didn't have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. And when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among the thorns which grew up and choked the plants so they didn't bear grain. Still other seeds fell on good soil. It came up and grew and produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, and even 100 times. And then Jesus says, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, the 12 and the others asked him about the parable. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But those outside, everything that is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving. And ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to him, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like the seeds along the path where the word is sown and as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes it away, the word that was sown in them. Others are like seeds sown in the rocky places. They hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, the last, excuse me, and they last only a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still other seeds are sown among the thorns. Hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires of other things come and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown in the soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, even 100 times what was sown. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that, Lord God, reveal it today, uh, not only in Scripture, but in our spirit, Lord God, that we may understand your desire for us and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. So you have to understand in which the context in which Jesus is saying, he's talking about seeds. What are seeds? Seeds are the word of God. So many times people want to think they are the seeds and they're not the seeds. You and I are soil. So the question is this, what kind of soil are you? Right? When we break this down, in verse 3, it says, As he was scattering seeds, the seeds, some fell on the path, and the birds came up and ate it. And these would be the paths of like these aisles where everybody walks, where everybody tromps and it gets hard. And I don't know if you ever tried to plant a garden on concrete. If seeds cannot get down in the soil by at least a couple inches, it will not grow. And so many times we have people in our world who refuse to hear the word of God. They call themselves atheists. They say they don't believe in God, so he doesn't believe, belong. Well, I say I don't believe in atheists, so there's no such thing as an atheist. Good morning. That was a joke, right? But so many times we do. The person out scattering seeds would be thrown up, but some would fall on that hard path where people were walking. And unless the seed can actually get below the soil, it will not work. And if people are not willing to at least open up their minds and listen and think a little bit deeper about the context of this entire creation, they'll never get it. And it's just like throwing seeds on concrete. And what it'll do is just stay there and later on birds will come get it or animals and eat it up or the winds will blow it away. The same is true trying to evangelize to someone who refuses to even open up their mind and have a concept or a conversation about a great creator. Amen. The second one is this. It's found in verses five and six. It says, other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil and immediately it sprang up and since it had no depth for soil and when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. 
And this happens a lot when you're farming. You, you've got to get this uh, seed down in soil where there's plenty of loose soil underneath of it so the roots can grow. Because if the so seed cannot get roots, it will not really do anything. Oh, it'll germinate. Germination happens because the soil is not deep, so it's really warm. And in order for a seed to open up and germinate, it actually has to have a certain temperature for it to do that. So if it's really shallow, the seed will actually germinate and stay right there on the top. The same thing happens here. We get people come into a church and they get saved, sanctified, chicken fried, holy fried. They do all those things, but we don't plug them into discipleship. We don't plug them into any Bible studies, into any small groups or fellowship or anything else. And this 20 minutes that you're sitting in here is all you get. You really are like the seeds with no roots. The sun will come up. Pressure of this world will get you and you'll die. Your faith will diminish. Listen, I work on spiritual disciplines. Believe it or not, even though I'm a pastor and I'm the one up here preaching, I need to be ministered to as well. And if you know anything about me, I at least have one sermon a day I listen to. I surround myself with the favor of God, inviting the Holy Spirit into my life. I'm in the word of God every day. And if I didn't do that, I couldn't make it. But some of you are trying to make it on these 20 minute sermons it's more than a TED talk. It's, it's more than Kramer and the worship team entertaining you. If you're only getting this, you're not going to have a place for your roots to go. And when the pressures of this world come, they will get you. And the other one is this. It's found in verse 7. It says, other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. That's a lot of church people. The pressures of this world and everything that, that happens. You're worried about political news. You're, you're watching Fox News, CNN, MSNBC. CNN. You're watching all these and you have chicken little faith. You're running around screaming, the sky is falling. The wind is near instead of realizing the kingdom of God isn't missing us now. You're worried about the stock market. You're worried about your retirement and your investments. So you're not worried about your internal retirement. You're worried about this and you're worried about that. Or, or maybe you're a little different. Maybe you've come to know Christ, but you're still hanging out in the bars, uh, the brothels, and all the other places that were dragging you down to begin with. And all these pressures, and, and you're worried about having the nicest car or, or the biggest house or the biggest pool or whatever else you can get. And that is your sole focus. And it's like weeds. I don't know how many of you guys have a garden. But I promise you, when we plant a garden, no matter how small, or rose bush, we always pull the weeds because we realize those weeds will suck the nutrients out of the soil. Some of you may be in here this morning have still been planted where there's a lot of weeds. And you haven't removed the weeds in your life. And every time something happens like the Vegas shooting or the, the um, hurricanes in Texas, Florida, the earthquake, and all your atheist friends start speaking on you. All of a sudden, you still come to church, but you have no fruit. You are showing no grain. And yet God has planted you to be a missionary where you're at. Statistics show that 90% of all Christians have never, ever, ever led anybody to the Lord. Yet Paul says they will know you by your fruit. Growing up on the farm, I'll tell you, even a blind squirrel finds a nut every once in a while if it just walks around. Think about it. 90% of all Christians have never led anybody to the Lord. And yet it says some seeds fell in good soil and produce a crop. Excuse me. Other seeds fell among the thorns and the thorns grew and choked it up. And it yielded no grain. None. Christians, what kind of soil are you in? Are you being so choked out by the world that you bear no fruit? Since they will know you by your fruit. Is that you? Have you put yourself in the atmosphere that all you do is worry about the, the latest little social issue or the latest cause or the, the next rally or the next thing you can buy or the biggest woe that's being broadcasted on the news? Or are you rooting yourself in Jesus Christ? 
The other one comes out. This is a good one. And other seeds fell on good soil, produced grain growing up, and then increased a yield 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. Is that you? I mean, since they're going to know you and I by our fruit, do they? And it's very simple when, when Jesus teaches on this parable. It, it's a very simple thing. Jesus says, a farmer, that's me, goes out and sows seeds. He scatters some here and there and throws it around. Right? When I'm preaching every week, this is what I'm doing. It's the word of God. Right? Is it? When I preach every week, all I do is sit and <laughs> preach. And I'm sowing seeds. Right? This is what we do in church. Yes, you can throw them back at me. Because I need the word of God as well as you. Right? Are the seeds good? Right? What are the seeds, Liam? I'm an equal opportunity jerk, Liam. I'll hit kids where I'm from. Right? <laughs> Listen. This. These are the seeds, the word of God. Are they good? Have I done my job? Right? I've been scattering seeds. I've been doing it here for two years. Two years. I've been sowing seeds every week in you. Tell me the word of God is not good. Right? Blessed are the feet that bring the word of God. I, I bring it every week. So does Kramer and, and Ben and Wes and Stephen and the rest of you. We are farmers. We are sowing seeds. But here's where it comes in. You are the soil. What kind of soil are you? Are you that hard soil? No matter what we say, no matter what we preach, you refuse to absolutely believe the word of God. You come here every week with the defensive mechanism. Prove to me there's a God and I have no problem with that. But sooner or later, we should be breaking through your soil. Or maybe you're the soil that, that comes in and you're shallow and oh, you got the Holy Ghost moment for a few days. But after a while, the fun isn't there anymore and you're barely hanging on. And the pressures of this world is getting you. Or maybe you're the Christian. Oh, you're here, but... Your social, private life is junk. There is no Christianity in your life outside of these walls. And you wonder why you're not growing. You wonder why you can't lead people to Christ. You wonder why your faith is almost obsolete. I remember at my last church in Denver, I had a lady. Man, this girl was on social media. Um, you guys remember MySpace? She was on MySpace throwing out the F-bomb, cussing, talking about parties. I mean, just horrible, right? She come up to me one Sunday. She goes, Pastor, I invite everybody to church. I don't know why they won't come with me. I'm thinking, crud, I'm your pastor, and I wouldn't go to church with you. How's your life? I mean, you say you come to church. That's great. Are you producing any grain, any fruit? I mean, the truth of it is, you're the soil. I'm the farmer. Here they are. Here's the seeds. Are the words of God growing in your life? Are they producing any fruit? Because at the very end, it was great. Others like seeds sown in good soil, hear the word, accept it and produce a crop. 30, 60 or even a hundred times what was sown. Is there any transformation in your life? See, that's the truth of this seed. Have you ever seen how big a pumpkin plant gets? How much fruit it produces from that little bitty seed. But you have to let that little seed get in you. And it's not about being entertained by me or the worship team. It's not about how much money you can give or how many times you show up here. The truth of it is, if 90% of all Christians have never led anybody to the Lord, that means there's a whole lot of weeds in our lives. 90% of all Christians have never led anybody to the Lord. 
And it says, if you live with weeds, you will bear no grain. I don't know if you ever read the book, 90 Minutes in Heaven. Uh, not 90 Minutes in Heaven. Heaven or, yeah, 90 Minutes in Heaven. It's a pastor who dies and goes to heaven. He, and he says in his book, as he gets to the gate, anybody who he had ever told about Jesus, ever witnessed to, ever had Christian fellowship, was there waiting. I don't know about you, but I love to party. And when I get to heaven, I plan on having a big reception because I want to know that I'm going to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. In you, I'm well pleased. You have produced fruit, a crop yielding 30, 60, even 90 parts. I can tell you now if my brother got in there and messed up the GPS and the crop was scattered in a mess, it wouldn't yield much. Matter of fact, if you're really good, your crop could produce 90% gain. 90%. I will tell you this, for the rest of the year, if you really want to produce a harvest, each one win one. Who do you know in your life that needs to hear about Jesus Christ? Who do you know in your life you can begin to pray for today? Who do you know that you could start to share a meal with, time with, witness to, help them out? Your faith is not your own. You are here because somebody told you about Jesus. The question is, who are you telling? Who are you sharing? Or is this just about you? Maybe you were raised in this church and that's been part of nature of life. And you just expect the next generation, the next generation, the next generation. As you can tell by looking around, that doesn't work anymore. It hasn't been working for the last 20. And I don't know about you, but I believe hell is for real. And I think to myself, how much do we have to hate people to let them go to hell? Or how much can we love people to be strong enough to tell them the truth? But the question is, how is your soil? Is this Christian faith changing you? Is it germinating up in you? And maybe you're saying, Brad, it's been a hard life. And I'm like that hard path, great. Or maybe there's some rocks, great. Maybe there's some weeds, great. You're right where you need to be. So why don't we get busy and pull the weeds? Why don't we start removing the rocks? Why don't we get some shovels and start tearing up the hard path? Because the Holy Spirit can do all of those. You don't have to stay where you are in your faith. Your faith can grow. You are responsible for your faith. The Apostle Paul put it this way, work out your own salvation. In other words, you can't blame somebody for you being a hard path or, or rocky or weedy. You just can't. When you get to heaven or, or you have paradise and you're standing before the throne of God, trust me, there's no excuse that's going to get you in heaven or keep you out of hell. Work out your own salvation. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're here for each other. We'll help each other. When one is low, pick the other one up. Because there'll be a day you're low or maybe you're high. Or maybe you just got a shovel in your hand and a hoe and you're ready to go to work. Stand with me this morning.